Good, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Don't make me use my marine voice. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Lake Elsinore. My name is Brian Tizzo. I'm on the city council. Standing beside me is Mayor Johnson. Uh, we formed the task force for our city, and so we want to welcome all of you here today. 
Uh, this regional effort is so important with what we're trying to do. Because anyone that knows that if you're dealing with a homeless issue, one city, one county, one person is not going to do it. it takes a, it's going to take a village, the whole village in this case. And so I'm glad that everybody can turn, come out today. We have a great turnout. We look forward to hearing from the speakers. And so we're excited that you're here. And I'm going to turn it over to Aaron, and he's going to take it from here. Hello, everybody. We just wanted to thank you for coming out. And uh, kind of the reason we are doing this is uh, dealing with substance abuse and mental illness is so difficult. Um, I know I need all the training in the world. And so we said, let's look to an expert to help us understand and, and give little strategies. And I know the people that do the work on the streets, the deputies, I mean, I know they all know how difficult it is. And, and uh, they're able to help us considerably. But that's why we have the expert. And uh, we did want to thank uh, Twin Builders Construction, uh, Helping Hands of Corona, CRNR, and Discount Hauling. Um, they helped make this possible. Um, Jeff wasn't free, but he was almost free, and so we wanted to thank him for that. Um, if if that's if that's all I got to say. So Jeff, if you're ready. Hey there. Okay, well, I just have to tell you that if this was back in my addictive days and I came by here and saw the cop cars out there and all of you in here, I'd be robbing shit. I'd be out stealing like crazy from 1.30 to 3.30. <laughs> oh man, this is, a, it's a, if we weren't, if we were just talking about addiction, it would be a huge issue. But we're talking about addiction and how it relates to the homelessness, and um, so I'm going to try to connect those two. But you know, you 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 folks are the experts in working. I'm I'm a, I'm at a disadvantage because I don't know the people here like you know the people here. I'm at an advantage because I can start a bunch of fires and then go home, and and not have to deal with the fires. And I hope I don't do too much of that. But I would like to kind of try to connect some dots for you to make you better helpers and and uh, for, for this problem. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about addiction first. And uh, if we're talking about, and the reason I'm doing this is because basically the response to homeless people, uh, even from the federal government all the way down, has basically been in thinking that job training and all that would solve it because that's what's causing it, joblessness and stuff. But I don't, I don't agree with that. And I think that if you take people who are um, addicted or dual diagnosis, meaning addicted and some other mental health thing, and put them in job training, it's not going to do any good anyway. You've got to deal with those other issues first. And just to tell you what I mean when I say dual diagnosis, let's, let's say that a person is an alcoholic for 30 years and now they're depressed because their life sucks and the dog ran away and plus they've been drinking a depressant for 30 years. The diagnosis is alcoholism. The depression is like a spin-off of that. So you go to the Betty Ford Clinic and they treat the diagnosis, which is alcoholism, and during the course of that they get to the depression, but the diagnosis is alcoholism. But now let's say the person is depressed anyway, or OCD, or post-traumatic stress disorder or bipolar or whatever, but they don't know what they are. They just don't like it. So they become the doctor and the pharmacist and start prescribing mood-altering substances for themselves to try to treat the first diagnosis, which is a mental health diagnosis. Then they get addicted and now you've got dual diagnosis. And those two things wrap around each other like a couple of vines on a trellis. And if you tear one down the other, and not the other, the other one comes back. That person that I just described could go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, fund their retirement, and never get better if they don't deal with the addiction part too. Or they could be like the phone calls I get you know, to do interventions. So someone will call me and they'll talk about doing an intervention. And they go, but you know, I don't know if this will do any good because they've been in treatment five times already. And as we're talking more, they're telling me about a dual diagnosis person, you know? And I'll say, is that those treatment centers dual diagnosis? No, what's that? They don't even know what that is. So they just keep 
treating the addiction side of it and sending them home and then the mental health side is still there and then the addiction comes back and that keeps happening over and over again. Homelessness is not, you know, I guess officially a diagnosis, but just look at that as another diagnosis. Okay, so you got dual diagnosis and homelessness as a diagnosis and they all get wrapped up together like a vine on, vines on a trellis. But my bias is not that joblessness caused ho homelessness and that if you provide job training it'll solve this for people. My bias is that the other two diagnoses are underneath the whole thing um, from the start pretty much and having said that then I'm going to do a disclaimer that says you know what it doesn't matter how they got here. I mean okay if you are a homeless person and you end up getting some kind of treatment or therapy for whatever else is going on in your life, it will matter then how you got here because you have to heal from those things and untangle those things and stuff. But to talk about how the homeless problem became the homeless problem, how it happened is not helpful. You know, who, who here has a five-year-old? You got a five-year-old or ever? No? Okay, you. Okay, so you have a five-year-old. You, okay. <laughs> So probably, you know, you told them, don't go run on the road, you could get hit by a car, right? I mean, no, those, you all can relate to that, right? Don't go on the road, okay? If they went on the road anyway and got hit by a car, you would not go out there and go, I wonder if it was a Dodge or a Ford. <laughs> would you? No. And you wouldn't go, oh, I, wonder, I wonder if they came out the front door of the garage there. How do they get here? You wouldn't point your finger at him and say, you were supposed to lock the door. You'd say, there are people that deal with this. Let's get them there. And then if they have to figure out why they keep running on the road all the time, that's a therapeutic issue. But that's not, that's not helpful right now because we're looking at people that got run over by a car which makes it kind of sound more victim -y than I want to make it sound. But, you know, what are we going to do about that? Not let's scratch our heads and keep figuring out over and over again how did this happen. What are we going to do about it? Because there are some things to do about it. Um, so back to my original thing about addiction. We're talking about ad addiction. to mostly mood-altering substances. Now there are some other addictions I'm not going to get into here. Okay, so there's like two columns. Now this is not a medical talk, okay? So I'm going to be not exactly medical about all this. I'm going to be more categorical about this, you know. But over on this side, when people get addicted to the substance, that would be alcohol or opiates or benzos, like Xanax, ben Valium, benzos. You get addicted to the substance, which means your body learns to need it, your body gets accustomed to it, needs more to get the same effect. That's tolerance, and your body gives you a signal when you don't have it called withdrawal. Actually, the most dangerous withdrawal here would be alcohol, maybe, maybe benzos too, but alcohol. Opiate withdrawal hurts more. I mean, it might hurt so bad you jump out the window, but it's not the absence of heroin that kills you, it's jumping out the window. But with alcohol, the absence of alcohol could kill you, which if you ever watch the show that I've been on, we're always going to detox. Even if the person says they don't need it, which mostly they always say they don't need it, and then most of the time they need it, but we're going to err on the side of being too cautious versus not cautious enough and get them a safe, you know, supervised medical detox before they go to treatment because physically that's a good idea, but also what treatment center wants to have somebody who's stoned and preoccupied with drugs sitting in group? What are they going to get from group and treatment? So they need to be detoxed first and then the detox center calls the treatment center and say, come pick them up, they're ready. Okay. Um, imagine the millions of people in our country who, if they keep drinking, it could kill them, and if they stop drinking, it could kill them too. Yet all the focus for most of these helpers is stop drinking. 
And for a lot of those people, it puts them in an imminently life-threatening you know, situation. Well, sometimes people get addicted to mood-altering, period. That would be meth. Okay. Now, I'm not trying to say there's no physical ramifications from meth, but what happens is the, the person gets addicted to the phenomenon of the roller coaster of mood altering itself. This is why you can lose your family over gambling or other process or life kinds of lifestyle addictions, meth and cocaine and, believe it or not, pot. The legalization of pot will keep me in work for the rest of my life. It will. It will. 70% of illicit drug addicts started by using pot. I don't know why we would make it more easy for them to do that. And you'd think, you know, if I, if I came up with a policy that guaranteed you work for the rest of your life, you'd be happy. I'm not happy because I think it's a bad thing, you know. I think that... But the, but the thing is, if you're addicted to pot and you stop using pot, your, your body doesn't say, where's the pot, and throw you on the ground having a seizure and foaming at the mouth. Your mood does. Your mood says, where's the pot? That's the addiction part, you see. And, you know, after the meeting today, you guys could go to Bennigan's or whatever you got going on out here and have a couple of drinks, not for the purpose of being intoxicated. I, I don't relate to that myself because I always drank for the purpose of being intoxicated. I didn't even like the taste. That's not what I was looking for. You could drink two drinks not for the purpose of being intoxicated. The purpose of pot is to be intoxicated. I'm not talking about medical marijuana or whatever. I don't even know what I think about that. But the reason somebody uses pot is not to sit in the house at the end of the day smoking a joint and talking about how school went so well that day. Okay. They're, they're smoking a joint to watch, you know, the Three Stooges with the sound turned off, listening to Black Sabbath, like that's what I used to do. And, and let's say that you have to drive, and you start feeling just a little bit of an effect after the first drink, you push it away, because you have to drive. With pot, you're stoned on the first hit. You are impaired immediately. If you're a regular pot smoker, you don't have to keep smoking a bunch of pot to be impaired, just one time. So... Whatever. I'm on a different talk. But, but, but anyway, <laughs> my point is, meth withdrawal is not particularly dangerous. Okay? You sleep for like three days because you've been up for 10 days taking apart your stereo and your, you know, stuff that you can never put back together again. I mean, that's... <laughs> People that are addicted to opiates and alcohol, they are addicted to both substances and mood altering. And there's a cycle. And this is what people, I find, don't understand very much. And the cycle is like at 12 o'clock is preoccupation. Preoccupation is, I live up in northern Wisconsin, and when it's 10 degrees below zero for 10 days in a row, I start thinking about jet skiing somewhere. Or fishing in Florida or something like that. And what you're doing is you're borrowing pleasure from then to help you get through now. And that's not a bad thing. But if you were in my counseling office spilling your guts about your life problems and I'm looking at you, but really I'm thinking about jet skiing, well, then it's not a good thing <laughs> because it got in the way of life. So when I was in college, I could miss the lecture at 10 o'clock in the morning thinking about how stoned I was going to be at 8 o'clock tonight and who I had to call and how I was going to get there and where I was going to get the money. And if I called and they didn't pick up, I mood altered down. See, I was on a mood roller coaster about using, not just from using. Addicts do not have to use to mood alter. All we have to do is think about it. And we're already mood alters. So now we have mood altering at 12 o'clock and nobody used anything yet. And then over here are routines at 3 o'clock. Routines are the same way the person does the same thing over and over again. Goes to the same places, talks to the same people. Pill addicts, the pill, the pill uh, routine is right on the bottle because the medical industry knows that if they can get you in a routine, you're more likely to finish your penicillin, which you need to do. So they say, take this till it's gone, as directed. 
If you take it until you feel better and stop taking it, what happens? Anybody? No, worse than that. Yeah, it's not that you become immune to it, it's that the germs become tolerant to it. We've got tolerant germs now, not dead ones, just ticked off ones, okay? And now you have to take more to get the same effect. Just like with alcohol, when you get tolerant to it, you have to have more to take. But the pill addict, they go to this doctor and that pharmacist, and this doctor and that pharmacist, and they get a little paranoid. So then they go to that doctor and this pharmacist, and then they go here, and that's why you can catch them. Because <laughs> they leave a trail. They have a routine. Those of you who ever worked with heroin addicts know that they have a routine. They've got a kit. They take the kit out, lay it out. Here's the needle. Here's the spoon. You know, like that. Same thing. I like to hunt and fish. I grew up hunting and fishing. I like to hunt and fish. Okay, a week before the season, I take my rifle out and clean it. Then I take my long underwear out, make sure it still fits. Then I take my boots out, make sure there's no holes. And then I go to Cabela's and buy crap I don't need, just like last year. <laughs> and what I'm doing is I'm getting high on hunting, and I didn't go yet. And people do this with golf, and they do this with shopping, and they do this with skiing, and lots of things, you see. And certainly with drugs and alcohol. So now we got mood altering at 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock and nobody used anything yet. See, this is the part that people don't understand because they think that using is the problem and stopping using is the solution. Using is not the problem and stopping using is not the solution. Recovery is the solution which includes stopping using. You know, those of you who have a loved one in here, that's an addict and they're still using? If your goal is sobriety, that's your goal? Kidnap them. Lock them in a closet. If it's one of these, though, make sure there's a doctor in there, too. Lock them in a closet <laughs> for 10 days, and now you've got a sober person, and nothing will be solved for them. Nothing is solved. Recovery is about healing. Recovery is about living skills. Recovery is about quality of life. Then over here at 6 o'clock is using. And like I said, typically that's what people look at is the problem, so not using is the solution, which if you try to employ that solution with your alcohol-addicted loved one, you could kill them if that's all you did, is just make them stop using. And then over here at 9 o'clock is a low-mood place. This is where, they're, where they are when they're not using. They're in a low-mood place. A heroin addict goes around here six, seven times a day. So fast that you can't even tell where they are on there so much. You know? My great grandfather, he was sober for four months and he took off on a bender for a month. When he was sober, he was a farmer, not a very good farmer, because he was sitting on the front porch wishing he could drink. And then the month, he was a lumberjack. He was a drunk lumberjack. Then he'd feel like a bad guy, and he'd come home and be sober for four months, and everybody said, well, he can't be an alcoholic. He can't be an alcoholic and be sober for four months. No, it just took him five months. He still didn't have a job. He still lost his family. The cycle is the problem, not just use or don't use. So when I train people to, to do an intervention on their loved one tomorrow, pretty much they're going to say, after the, after the denial is gone, they're going to say, you're right, you're right. Okay, I, I'll stop. See, stopping using doesn't solve anything. Stopping using means that they're telling us they're going to go live in this low mood place. Well, if you're in this low mood place, what's the quickest, easiest way to not be there anymore? Anybody? Wrong. Start thinking about it. You don't even have to use to feel better. All you got to do is plan for it. Do you understand that? It's so insidious. It's so, all you got to do is start thinking about who you're going to call. Start revving up for it, just like planning a hunting trip. Just like, this is the problem. Now, this is harder to see with homeless people. It is, you know. You're more experts about homeless people than I am. Um, I, don't, I don't know what, to say, what else to say about that, except this. Job training is not going to fix this. 
and arguing about if lack of jobs caused their homelessness or their homelessness now contributes to their not having a job or addiction caused this or what, it doesn't matter. What matters is now what are we going to do with this person? And my suggestion is that we need to talk about the things besides job training. Now, I think you know this. Maybe you don't have these words. Maybe, I don't know. I think you know this. Do you know that it's always more cost effective for somebody to be well than it is for them to be sick? Always. Did you, did you, have, did you used to have drug court here? You used to have drug court? When I was working back at Hazelden, this is like in 1980, we used to get all these referrals from this, well, he was a judge. He was a, he was a traffic judge out in Washington County. And more than any other place, we were getting more referrals from him. We were wondering what's going on. So we went to see what he's doing. So if you ended up in his courtroom, what's your first name? Nicole. Nicole? Yeah. So if you ended up his, in his courtroom with anything having to do with drinking and driving or drugging and driving, he'd go like this. I don't even know how he kept a straight face because this is, you go, so Nicole, I don't know if the reason you got that DUI is because you're an alcoholic who likes to drive or a criminal who likes to drink. So why don't you just tell me which one of those you are and I'll put you in the right place. Guess what everybody picked? Everybody went to treatment. That was the 1980 version of drug court. And it was very effective to get people in the, in the treatment. But you know, if you had drug court and it wasn't so effective, I don't know how you would judge what's effective or not. Let me get, give you some statistics. I think you have drug court. Who's from Indio? You got drug court in Indio still? Yeah, OK. All right, here's my, here's my anecdotal statistics, but I think they're pretty accurate. In 2017, the United Way of Orange County and UC Irvine determined that there were like 1,600 unsheltered homeless people in Riverside County. Okay, and that number doesn't change too much from year to year, so 1,600, okay? They also determined that for, for every person, 85,000, it costs $85,000 for every person, counting first responders, um, hospitals, emergency rooms, social workers, okay, $85,000. That $85,000 does not count what those people aren't contributing to society because they're non-contributors, which they're not. That's just $85,000. That means that in the course of the year, $136 million is spent on those people. $136 million. <laughs> you could buy a pretty good treatment center for $136,000 million a year. Okay? But now there are statistics about that too, because you know people say, well, treatment's only 10 percent, you know, only 10 percent get better in treatment. Mostly the people who say only 10 percent, it only works for 10 percent of the people, mostly those are people who went to treatment but didn't stay. Okay? That's on the street. Now the only statistic I'm firsthand really familiar with is for, that, for the show intervention that I've, I've been part of, we've done over 300 interventions. Ten people didn't go. That's it. Ten people didn't go. And all the people that did go, 70% are still sober, which is outrageous. Okay? But let's say that out of these, all these people that we are spending $136 million on, we stopped spending the $136 million on them completely, put it all into treatment, sent them all the treatment, and only 10% got better out of, out of the total number, only 10%, not 70, just 10, okay? Well, that means that not only will that 10% start contributing back into society, but that means that that's $13,600,000 that doesn't have to be spent on them, which means next year you'd only have to spend 122400000 and the year after that only 100. 
million, 100 million, and after that, only 84 million. And, you know, I mean, I, it's more cost effective for people to be well than it is to be sick. Okay. Now, if the numbers don't change, so kind of 1,600 every year, then the $136 million isn't doing any good. You know, which isn't to say you shouldn't be doing what you guys are doing. I'm not saying that. This is above our, our pay grade, our pay level, deciding this kind of stuff. Because you folks have to do what you have to do because you're dealing with it firsthand. You've got to do it. But I'm just saying, let's bring back drug court. Because drug court takes a therapeutic track with people if they, if they choose versus a punitive track oh this doesn't even count the money spent to do job training that doesn't work that I don't think works I mean I'd be actually genuinely interested to know how effective job training is for addictive dual diagnosis homeless people does anybody know that have you heard any numbers like that holy cats see I'm sorry, but all this stuff is being decided by people that are not in the trenches. You folks are in the trenches. You know, if you had a magic wand, you'd fix this. You'd do things immediately differently, but you don't get to decide. Somebody else who isn't there gets to decide. I don't know what, to, what else to say about that. It pisses me off. I don't know what else to say about that, because I think we can do so much better with this. So anyway, any questions about this? Do you understand that using is not the issue here? The whole thing is the issue. Yeah. If they decide to go that direction, but they don't, they decide to use some more until they keep on that thing. That's the place where you, where you can find them where they might be more open to, to help. You know, that low spot, these people that we're dealing with, they're not bad people. They're, they're great people. It's just that that's what makes this a horror story. Because there was a time for most of them, I, I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there was a time for most of them when they actually had a top of their game. There was a top of their game at some point. And, you know, if I went and picked a homeless person off the street and asked him how long this has been going on, and they said, I don't know, 15 years, whatever. And I said, okay, if I had a conversation with you 16 years ago and I predicted the next 15 years, you wouldn't believe it. You know, their family's all looking at them going, I can't believe it. They wouldn't believe it. Here's the, here's the harm you're going to do yourself. Here's the lies you're going to tell. Here's the compromise. Here's the dreams you're going to give up. All, you wouldn't believe it, which means that person is living inconsistent with their value system. But the difference is, you folks, if you do something inconsistent with your value system, you feel bad and fix it. You know, when an addict feels, does something inconsistent with their value system, they feel bad and medicate it, and so the hole keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. You had a question. Uh, two questions for you. Where, you said uh, jet training really won't help. You don't recommend that. What about housing? I don't, I don't not re recommend it. Okay, I don't, I don't not recommend job training. I, I recommend it not being looked at as that's going to solve this. Can't there, are there any conditions to being able to live in the housing? You have to show consistent progress towards self-sufficiency. Okay, and if you don't, what happens if you don't show consistent progress towards self-sufficiency? It depends on, the, it depends on the, the, the place. I mean, obviously, everybody in this room supposedly believes in housing first. And the idea that there are no conditions, but that doesn't really happen. There usually are conditions. Some people say the answer 
answer to an addict on the street that doesn't want treatment would be to and hopefully or something. But what would your opinion be on that? Have conditions. There are conditions, and then we have yeah. the, the That would be my solution. Have, have yeah, have conditions. If, if we weren't talking about homeless people, we were just talking about your brother who now decided that he's got a problem and he's going to go to Sierra Tucson. There are conditions. So if he goes there and blows off the program and doesn't do anything, he doesn't get to stay there. Well, why should that be different? So he either stays there and, you know, he, he didn't, people don't go to treatment for the right reason. You know, most of the people we're talking about, homeless or not, who are addicted and having these kinds of issues, they're not walking down the street one day and go, oh, my life sucks. <laughs> I think I'll check into rehab. That, that doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, they, they go because the judge is going to say a scary thing or, or their spouse is going to say a scary thing or, you know, I'm only going to make you happy. Yeah. Okay, which is a bad reason. When we do an intervention, we don't care why they go. You know, if, 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 if they say, okay, I'm only going to make you happy, people are inclined to say, oh, no, you need to go for yourself. Okay? How many of you have ever sold clothes? Anybody ever sell clothes? Sell clothes? Boy, you just, like, you've done it all. You've done it all. Okay? <laughs> so what kind of clothes? Um, I worked at Nordstrom. Okay, so the dresses and, okay. So if somebody came, came up to you and said, I want to buy this dress, would, would you say, are you sure you're buying it for the right reason? No. no. <laughs> You say sale, okay? So now, instead of when your brother says, I'm only going to make you happy, say thank you, okay? Because if he goes for the worst possible reason, tonight he'll be in range of life. Because last night, he was in range of death. And he's not going as a client, but if he becomes a client, he'll stay for himself and that's when he gets better. And that's what happens with most people. You know, they don't go for themselves. They go for you or they go for the judge or they go for some other reason. But then at some point, they're thinking more clearly and they get a little hopeful and it's not the BS they thought it was. And they stay for themselves, then they get better. Okay. So I think there should be conditions, you know. And, and maybe... Part of the solution is taking some of the $136 million and expanding how much housing is actually available with conditions. Because that would be like throwing a big net out and catching some. And some is better than none. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if they come in and they have a place to stay and then later get the Okay, if they come in and it's required of them, for instance, you can't steal while you're here. Is that an okay condition? I mean, would you think that you should have that condition? Okay, so there already are conditions. Right. Okay. Um, the conditions that they're not going to like is... <laughs> we'll let you stay if you agree to work on yourself. <laughs> Basically, if, if you're going to work on yourself, then you can stay. Well, there are ways to communicate that in a less like direct way that I said, and even have less, you know, in other words, build higher expectations. But there needs to be, you know, when I worked in treatment, if you came into the treatment center, this is what we told you. Okay, <laughs> you have to stay as long as we say, do what we tell you when you're here, and go where we tell you afterwards. That's all. We didn't spell that out, okay? And if they didn't do that, we threw them out, okay? Because insurance money was going for nothing then, okay? But we could tweak that. You know, almost everybody agreed to that because that's so nonspecific, you know, stay as long as we say. 
And of course, this was like in 1978, so insurance companies are going, okay, just throw, you know, we had a 60 day treatment center and kept people around in 20 days. I mean, insurance companies said, okay, stay as long as we say, do we, what we tell you to. Like really horrible things, like make your bed now. <laughs> you know, c come to group on time. If you don't come to group on time, there are consequences. What are they? When you're sleeping in there, I'm going to bring the group in there, set up chairs. We'll do group in front of you right in your bedroom, <laughs> for instance. So it isn't like, you know, don't let the door hit you in the rear, you know, if you don't do everything we say. But so I, the, the trick is getting them in the door, okay, because now they're in range of life. And last night they were in range of death. But then being in range of life isn't enough. Then it has to be actually steps to take to be alive, to live, you know. So maybe you take the money and you buy more housing so more people can get in with, you know, with conditions. You know, there's a lot of programs that we have like this. Okay, how many ever broke your arm? Who broke your arm? You broke your arm. Okay, so when you break your arm, they put a cast on it. Okay, the purpose of the cast is to buy your arm time to heal so that when it heals, they take the cast off, all right? If they leave the cast on longer than that, it hurts your arm. It does damage. Your arm atrophies, you know, it, it okay. Now you see, I am in favor, for instance, of methadone programs if that's what they do. For instance, the purpose of a methadone program is to buy you time to get off of heroin so that when you're off of that and off of the opiate, then you don't need to go to the methadone program anymore. If it takes the place of that, not just buys time, but it takes the place of that, then it's better for society but not for the addict because now the addict is getting their pills from a clinic instead of robbing the 7-Eleven to get money for the pills. So it's better for me but not for them. Same thing with Suboxone and stuff like that, buy time. Okay, if the housing is buying them time to get on the right track, okay, but if it takes the place of living on the street, then no. That's my solution. <laughs> I don't know, you know, it's so huge. I don't even know how real those figures are, you know, I just did that on my phone on the way here. Um, but, and they're probably not exact, but you know, it's something like it's something like that. I wasn't trying to like make you realize certain figures as more of the concept of what we're dealing with here. We're spending our money to help things stay the same. And I think there we could spend money to help things change. I don't know. You know, I, I got four daughters. And if one of them called me up and said, you know, we just lost our jobs. You can't afford to our house anymore. Can we come live with you? I'd say, okay. Three months. Okay. I will buy you three months to get back on your feet. Once I buy you the three months, it's your three months. So I'm not going to follow you around making sure you're doing stuff. If you sit around eating chocolate-covered cherries and watching soap operas for three months, I'm not going to say anything until the end of the three months. Then you're gone because you did not use the time for the reason I bought it for you. If I keep them after that point, I'm enabling them. I'm harming them. And if I keep doing it after that point, I don't get to come over here and gripe about them because at that point it's me. Well, see, I think that there's some point in this whole homeless thing that it's us. So you're saying, so you're saying the constant SSI card, the constant snap card, the SSI for every little thing for any of these people. If they're not, if they're, if it's not, if it's, if. That, I think that. I don't know. I, I wouldn't know the answer to that as much as you would, but it looks like that. I don't know. Does it look like that to you guys? Yes. Well, it's better because we know that. Okay. Some know that. Some know that. There is no time limit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Why, why would they? They don't need to, right. the way it is now. Yeah. It's the same thing with, with once again, I, I refer back to doing an intervention. Okay? When you do an intervention with somebody, typically the reason they haven't gotten well up to this point is because they haven't had to. You know, somebody's buying their cell phone and somebody's letting them live in the basement and somebody's, but after today they have to because we're not doing that anymore. So we'll send them a treatment, which is basically buying them time to figure this out. If they get out of treatment and don't use the tools that they got in treatment, too bad for them then, you know. People used to get well before treatment when there was just Alcoholics Anonymous. People would get, get better. So yeah, I think you gotta evaluate if the time you're buying is being spent for the reason you're buying it. I think that's a, a, a reasonable kind of thing. Um, most addicts, now see most of the addicts I, I deal with are not homeless people. But it might apply to them. I'd have to figure out how it does, but I think it does. Most addicts, if it was just up to them, in and of themselves, don't even have the resources to be an addict. They, 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 they can't even fund their own addiction. You know, somebody's paying the bill. Somebody's, you know, if you're letting the addict live in your house, well, first of all, I would ask you, do you think that there should be an addict living in your basement? You'd say no. Then I'd say, well, then how, why are you letting that happen? And you go, oh, you know, like, that's okay. What other person in that condition of your, your daughter would you allow your grandkids to even be around? Anybody in that condition? No. What about a neighbor in that condition? No. What about a friend in that condition? No. What about a stranger in that condition? Certainly not. What about an enemy? Well, no. Well, your daughter then has a license to be less safe, less responsible, less accountable than a friend, neighbor, stranger, and enemy. So we gotta revoke that license. We have to hold them more accountable, more respons have be more responsible, safer, you know, because your daughter is their mom. Moms are supposed to be safer than those other people. So now we're going to require her to be safer, but she can't, so we're going to send her to treatment so she can get the tools to be able to do that. And now we're helping something happen that we agree with, you know. How many of you think your, your, your son or daughter should be using their cell phone to call people that sell dope? Nobody. Well, then why are you paying the bill? Oh. See, if everybody stopped supporting just the simple things, stop supporting things on the outside that they don't agree with on the inside, addicts' problem would become their problem. And as soon as it becomes their problem, the odds go up to get better because right now they get to have the problem and you get to have the pain and the consequences. And I think this is what's happened with homeless people. They get to have the problem and society gets to pay the consequences. Not really. Right. No, they're not really homeless. They got you guys. Right. You, you deliver food to them. Nobody delivers food to me. <laughs> I should be homeless. <laughs> you know, you take them places. I don't know. I'm being semi facetious here, but I, you know, I get your point. Yeah, so it's about deciding what you agree with and help it happen and stop helping something happen you don't agree with, that's all. You know, my daughter, I have, I have four daughters. My oldest daughter, she was gone for a year in West Africa, and that means that since her job was to take out the garbage, somebody had to volunteer and step up and do that for a year. So I did that because I agreed with her going to South Africa. So then she comes back from South Africa and she gets her job back. Now in Minnesota, Minnesota, in Minnesota, geez, two feet of snow doesn't always close schools. Sometimes it depends on the wind and what the temperature is and if the plows got out. Okay, so she got home on a Wednesday, Thursday, Blizzard, two feet of snow, 
Friday, garbage day, 150 foot long driveway. Big garbage can with wheels you had to pull it down there. I got up in the morning, I looked. I could tell she had looked at the garbage because there were little footprints in the snow. <laughs> and then she downed the driveway and off she was, you know. Okay, so now, the job I volunteered for, I'm getting by default. I think that concept applies here. The job I'm volunteering for, I'm ending up by default. Now if I take out the garbage, I'm helping something happen I don't agree with, which is her not doing her garbage job. Now her problem has become my problem. So I wheeled it in the house up the stairs and put it in her bedroom. <laughs> really. Now it's her problem. So she comes home, it's thawed out now. And it reeks. And she comes in, the first thing she says is, if I'm in therapy when I'm 25, this will be why. I said, I just want you to know how I'm going to do your garbage job every time I get it like this. Every time I get it this way, this is how I will do it. And I think you are so capable that you could figure out a way to not have this happen anymore. And then it never did happen anymore because now her problem was her problem. And when her problem's her problem, she can do something about it. But when her problem's my problem, she doesn't have to. That's what's happened here. And it's not just like snapping your fingers and now we're going to make their problem their problem. There's more involved to doing that, but I think it can be done. I, I don't know. Can it be done? I think it can. You, you have, just think of the resources and the money and the people and everything you're pouring into something that helps it stay the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the other side. See, that's... Yeah. To, that they, then they would be responsible to deal with that first. You know, and you don't have to have some heavy duty kind of treatment center. Just start addressing the issue. The fact that you're addressing this here now, even, even if we were talking about homeless people, I never turned down a chance to talk about addiction. You know why? Because the hallmark symptom of addiction is denial. So anytime you talk about it, more. Per permission is given for people to talk about it, the more lives are saved. You know. And it just happens to be in relation to homelessness now, but and I think it's intertwined uh, severely. Somebody over here? <coughs> you know, and for me, I'll show you. I'll show you another thing, and then apply it to, to homelessness. Okay, so this this is a, a mood continuum. This is this be high and low. This is a using continuum. This would be abstinent and addicted. So all the homeless people and all the addicts and everybody here and me and the whole world is somewhere between abstinent and addicted. Okay, when a person uses a mood alter. When the effect wears off, they come back down to normal. I don't know how to draw normal, so I just, you know, drew a straight line. Usually, a straight line means you're dead, but but in but this just means you're normal. Okay. Um, society's definition of appropriate social using is using drinking over the age of 21 without consequences. That's about it. Now we're making marijuana be about that too, but. You know, drinking above the line without consequences over the age of 21. How many of you have ever heard the term recreational use? Okay, how many of you have ever heard the term recreational use when referring to like cocaine or something like that? My buddy uses cocaine recreationally. Okay. 
that would be like, you know, on the way over here today, the speed limit was 55, but Aaron and I went 105 because we're recreational drivers. <laughs> no, no. What we did was we decided that law only applies to everybody else, not us, which is already addictive thinking. Those of you who know about addiction, that's already thinking like an addict, okay? There's no such thing as recreational use of a fel felony substance. That's an oxymoron. That's, that's, a, that's foolish, okay? Over the age of 21 without consequences. Well, now let's say you do something here that you wouldn't have done if you hadn't been drinking or using some mood-altering substance. Then, instead of stopping at normal, you come down here with a little signal feeling guilty or humiliated or bad or whatever like that. So let's say that, let's say I said a hurtful thing to you, which I have a value system that says don't say hurtful things to people, which doesn't mean I never do that because I'm normal. But when I do that, I feel bad. So then I come and apologize and make amends and make it right, and then I feel better. I come back up here. But what if instead of doing that, I say, I'm fine, something else is the problem. You know, who could blame me for saying that to her? She did such and such. Now you see, now she's responsible for my behavior. So instead of fixing it, I stuff it, and I blame her. And here's the, here's the big blame. And you can hear this, all you gotta do is turn on the news and listen to Trump or Clinton or anybody, okay? Look, the problem's not the problem. Talking about the problem's the problem. How many versions of that have you heard? There wouldn't even be a problem if you weren't making such a big deal about the problem. You know, if this room was pitch black, no light whatsoever, and you're all doing nasty stuff, and I come in and turn the light on, there you are. The light is not the problem. <laughs> and I'm not the problem for turning on the light. But what you're going to do is you're going to try to make me feel like I'm the problem or the light's the problem. And if I believe that, I'll turn the light off and then you go back to doing nasty stuff. <laughs> there wouldn't even be a problem if you were making such a big damn deal about the problem. I mean, that happens every day in politics, every day. Well, the next time this person uses, they don't start from here, they start from here. And then they keep doing stuff for 15 years or however long against their value system, keep getting signals that they're ignoring and now medicating. And after a year or a month or 15 years or 30 years, now they're down here with a great big heavy load of frozen up pain and a big thick wall of denial. You see, if you tell this person to stop using, you're telling them to live here. They're not going to do that. There are bigger issues than just stopping using. You know, you guys went to a wedding last week. That's a pleasurable event. They had champagne, took a couple hits, knocked it up. Came back down, came back to normal. So normal for you is when you're not drinking champagne. Normal for them is when they are drinking champagne or whatever. Except they're not even getting back up to normal. But see, you have to understand that when people get to the addict stage, they're not using the party anymore. The party's over. The party is, you know, I call you up and say, hey, Packers won the Super Bowl, let's get drunk. That would be a party, or even like a bizarro world party. The Packers lost the Super Bowl, let's get drunk. I mean, either way, these people are not using the party. They're using to not withdraw and to try to be normal. And bipolar people, because bipolar looks like this, One of the flags that I see, which doesn't mean this is for sure, because I'm not a psychiatrist, but it's a red flag, is when I see somebody who's using stimulants and sedatives both at the same time. So if they're using, well, we talked about this. 
So you're using heroin and meth. Okay, so you're using heroin to try to take this top peak off, and they're using meth to try to take the bottom peak off because they're just trying to be normal. But they have become the doctor and the pharmacist, and now they're addicted, plus whatever else is going on with being bipolar, so nothing solved, it just com compounds the issue. So if you come to this person and say, don't use, stop using, you shouldn't use, or just force them into simply not using, that puts them in this low mood place again, which doesn't solve anything. Now, if you take this graph and draw it till it hits the floor, there's an intervention coming anyway. Did you know that there's always an intervention coming anyway? Always. When that intervention happens, then the judge has the final say, or mental illness has the final say, or death has the final say, or killing somebody else has the final say, and we don't have anything to say anymore. See? And how many of you have ever heard the thing, unless a person hits rock bottom, they're not going to change? I would be surprised if there are any here that didn't, haven't heard that. Okay? Unless a person hits rock bottom, okay. I agree with that, but here's the deal. If I have a rubber ball, and I bounce it on the floor, the place where it hits the floor is bottom because it can't go any further in that direction. So it takes a bounce. Now, if you're dead, you don't get a bounce. If you're in prison, you don't get much of a bounce. If you lost your mind, you don't get much of a bounce or any. Why don't we raise bottom and have them hit it tomorrow? Why do we have to sit around wringing our hands hoping somebody wakes up before they kill themselves or somebody else? Isn't there something we can still say that they might care about or something we can still do that will have the, the function of raising bottom to have them hit it tomorrow? That's why I do interventions. We raise bottom so the person hits it tomorrow because tomorrow they can still get a pretty good bounce. These homeless people that you deal with, they can still get a pretty good bounce today. Why wring our hands or, or fund them to go further down the road? You know, let's find a way. I don't know the answer to this, by the way, because you're probably thinking how, and I'm thinking that too, okay? <laughs> but there's got to be a way to raise bottom, you know, and have them hit it sooner than just doing nothing and have them hit the inevitable bottom, which is death. Not intervening, there's no happy ending. Like I said, they're not going to wake up one day and go, I need help, and go get help. That's not going to happen. Here's another thing. All this money that's being thrown, okay, let me be clear. I think you guys, when you work on behalf of homeless people, it's because you care for homeless people. You care about, when you show up, you care about that person. I don't think the people that decide the money care about homeless people. Sorry, I mean, I don't think they do. You know, in, in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, we have people, and I'm, I'm aware of this because I like to hunt, and I got guns, and I shoot deer and all this stuff. We got people that are against hunting, against shooting, friends of animals, picketing, the whole thing, until the deer are eating their shrubs. And then they hire professional hunters. Same with geese, until they're crapping on the golf course. Then they hire people like that. So they don't care about deer and geese. And they don't, you know, even though they're carrying signs, save the geese, they care about their lawn, and they care about the neighbors, and they care about what people think. And I, you know, I mean... I could be wrong, but isn't some of this effort that we're putting into this at a higher level just because it would look really bad if we didn't? And, and I don't know. Maybe it would be not safe for you to nod your head even if I, even if, even, even, even if, even if you agree, maybe, maybe just sit there and you know, smile or something. But that's not because if people really cared about homeless people, we could find a better place to put $136 million. 
Now, I don't know how you get to those people to get, make that point and get them to change. I don't, I'm, a, I'm about as non-political as you can be. I don't know any of that stuff, you know. But any thoughts? You said raise the bottom. Yeah. Well, raising bottom isn't beneficial if when they hit that bottom now, there isn't any place to send them that helps. That's the biggest thing. I, I, I don't think it's, you know, drug court raises bottom. It says you're not going to go any further in this direction without consequences or without getting help. So there's bottom now. And then, um, but drug court actually then provided some help like a different diversion kind of pathway. Um, so yeah, but I think, I don't think we're short of money. I think we've got money to do this. It's just being spent weirdly. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it's local and state and national. I think it's on all the levels for sure. But like how many citations do can a person get? For instance, how many? Well, uh, well I mean. An unlimited number of citations? No, our DA says 14. If they get 14 citations and they don't show up, they can be held in jail until their court date. 14 citations. I love that if I'm them. <laughs> well, I can cite you every day. Yeah, I know. Well, I can cite you every day. It takes me two weeks to put you in. Wow. Communicating to people about enabling, and that's something yeah. we're trying to do regionally, and I think it goes back to what you were saying, even with your daughter. When we, when we stop making it our problem and making it their problem, if our whole community got behind that idea of giving in the right ways, going to an organization like you said that you really believe in, rather than giving money directly to that person, all right, one of the things I think you need to do is define enabling in a more user-friendly way. I'll tell you what my opinion is of that, but enabling is like the bad E word, you know, just like codependency, which got trashed by Saturday Night Live pretty bad and Stuart Smalley and all this, you know. Our senator from Minnesota. Al Franken. You know, Al Franken was Stuart Smalley on Saturday Night Live. I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone people like me. Okay. You know, I first saw him, I saw him as the gorilla guard on trading places. When they smuggled that gorilla, that guy in the gorilla suit, he was the guard. From there to U.S. Senator. Go figure. <laughs> okay. But, yes. I forgot what you were saying. Yeah, the enable, here's what I, okay, enabling, here's my definition of enabling, okay? Unhelpful or harmful help with good intentions. Unhelpful, help that doesn't help, or harmful help, help that actually makes things worse, with good intentions. People who are enablers don't have bad intentions. How can I make my husband sicker? No, they, no, they're not, you know. Yeah, that's a therapeutic issue. I'm just, instead of looking at that issue, look at it like they have good intentions, but the help's not helping. Correct. You know, and identify the help that's not helping and stop doing the help that's not helping. We say you give a hand up rather than a hand out. Yeah. Yeah. And how many flyers did we do? 15,000. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, I've been in a situation where, where uh, I, I've been going into a restaurant and there's a homeless person there and they want some money and then I say I'll be right back and go buy him some food and they don't want the food so then no food okay 
But I think I'm helping something happen that I don't agree with if I just give them money. Unless they're going to buy food, which they're not going to buy. So, okay. I don't have to help things happen that I don't agree with. You know, and I don't know God's will in all these decisions. Like some... One of my... Third daughter, Jessie, was in a junior high orchestra when she was in seventh grade. I don't ever know if you ever heard that, but that's like music from hell. These are kids. <laughs> these are kids with accordions and tubas and violins and, yeah, orchestra. I had a tuba player, seventh grader, in my house, okay? So now the big concert is coming. So her older sister says, Dad, are you going to make me go to Jessie's concert? <laughs> I said, no, I'm going to make you go. If I made you go, you would look like you support your sister when you really don't. So no. She's like, thank you. <laughs> Fifteen minutes later, hey, Dad, can I have a ride to Judy's house? No. no. Why not? <laughs> well, because I think you should go to the concert. So if I think you should go to the concert, why would I take you to Judy's house? Now, see, that's where the God part comes in. I don't know if it's God's will if she goes to the concert or Judy's house. I just know what I agree with. So I'm not going to help stuff happen I don't agree with. She says, fine, I'll get my own ride. <gasps> That's what we do. <laughs> You're on your way to being an adult. We get our own ride. You know, cities and counties and states and countries need to say, are we helping stuff we agree with or not? Intentionally. You know, I mean, there's going to be spillover and waste and stuff unintentionally. But intentionally, are we... Could we do better? And I think we could. And, you know, I'm sounding like I'm running for office now because that's the right thing to say to the people in the trenches. But I, I'm, I'm in the trenches, you know, and I see it all the time. Anybody else? Solve this. Somebody. Yeah. Well, if, you, if, you, if, if it's clear to you which are the people that are the bad people, don't send it there. You know, I mean, but see, when people call me to do an intervention, I never get asked to help bad guys. You know, I mean, when, when, <coughs> if they're bad guys, people say, screw them, they're bad guys, we're done. You know, I get called to help good people who've lost control or are down the road somewhere. And as much as you're able to discern those two groups, um, I mean, you can, if, you might not be able to tell right away, but at some point you can tell somebody who's playing the system intentionally. Goodbye. We're done. You know? Um, I don't know if that answers you. What happens to them? Why is that our problem? Not them. Right. Right, so, so it is our problem. So then if we step in to do something, then it's more about shooting the deer, eating shrubs. Not because we care about deer. So if that's what it is, let's just say that and shoot the deer. Okay, I mean, really. I don't, I don't know if you should shoot the deer, but the point is. It comes down to enforcement at some point, and so they have to obey the same laws that the rest of the Right, and if they don't obey them? We take them, we take them to jail, and they won't keep them there, but at least it disrupts their daily routine, and it makes it a little bit more difficult. But well, we don't take them there because as a whole, right. we voted not to take them there. Right. That's right. And so we can go up. All right, how many, 
non-homeless people could get away with what the homeless people are getting away with. Right, but how many could get away with it? No, we'd hold them accountable. But somehow the homeless people don't have to be held accountable. They just need to be held. Well, then there needs to be a better way. But you already know that. I mean, we just don't know what it is. Right. Right. So if we were only 10% successful, we would save $13,600,000. <laughs> and that's very true. Thanks. Only 10%. Thanks, and I think it's more than 10%, by the way. I, I think that that whole 10% only, only works for 10% of the people is a bogus statistic because, you know, I'm around people that go to treatment and get out of treatment all the time, and it's, it's much higher than that, yeah. you know. Problem. I know. And there's both sides of the thing. I mean, even the people that are like, like um, arguing for feeding and helping them from a biblical standpoint, you know, feed the poor, take care of the poor, on the one hand, then there's the other hand that's saying, Paul says, if you don't work, you don't eat. So that even is on both sides. I mean, you, you don't have any control over that. All you have control over is helping things happen you agree with. I think so too. It, you know, it would be like saying, okay, so now like when you don't like this enough, give us a call. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I hear a lot of negative consequences, but what if we were to give them instead of shut everything off, but you were to say, um, you could receive these things if you did these things proactively versus, versus I'm going to turn the light switch off or I'm going to turn the light switch off. What if we turn it into a dimmer switch where they could earn the food from the food pantry, the clothing? Well, that would be that would have, that would work with responsible homeless people. <laughs> no, it wouldn't because they wouldn't be able to do what they need to do to get the light switch turned on because they're out of control with their addiction or their mental illness. What if they? Because I'm a licensed therapist and I work in addiction. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah, let's. Yeah. Let's do that. That's great. Yeah. You know that may that may that's not a good good idea. It might work, but now if it was me, I'd be trading the token for dope. I'd, I'd that would become currency like Bitcoin. I would I would, you know. <laughs> I you know. 
No, I'm going for ten. I'm going for ten percent improvement and making thirteen million. That's what I'm going for. Well, that's a different talk, but yeah. That's a different talk. Yeah. Uh, I'm taking a little bit of that line there and putting them in to prevent the increase. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because that increases the odds that the numbers will go down instead of spending money for things to stay the same. That's That's... That's as specific of a point I can make about that. I just don't get that. And I don't get the people that are deciding how much money and deciding who to give the money to don't get that. I mean, even I get it, and I live in the woods. Yeah. I didn't hear you. Yes. Yeah. I got I got thirteen million six hundred dollars. Yeah. Well, kind of, kind of an answer. It's not, it's not directly answering your question. I was semi facetiously saying I got 13 million, but I got 13 million. Let's build a place. Let's find a program for the people that don't have insurance and stuff. And the only requirement is that you have to be homeless without insurance to get in there. Okay, you can't like go in there because you'd like to go in there. And yeah. But as you move forward on this, okay, I want to encourage you to not do something, and that is to not think that outpatient is going to touch this issue, because it's not. Outpatient, outpatient treatment is for a, mo a motivated person who's got a life. Okay, so like they are the manager of the Toyota dealership, and they got 47 employees, that they can't just walk away for 30 days in inpatient and their life isn't hasn't fallen apart but their boss comes and says you know what you got to do something here you know and then they check in the outpatient because they're motivated and they have a life to go back to and but for the people we're talking about outpatient doesn't have a prayer That and then they have the other intervention. Well, another thing is about the outpatient thing, which is, I don't know if it relates to this or not, but um, there are insurance companies that won't pay for you to go to inpatient until you have failed outpatient two or three times. What? Some of the inpatients are totally for profit. Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, but I don't understand <coughs> why the insurance companies think that that is cost effective. But somehow, they do. I don't know. I'm going to build a treatment facility that only lets homeless people without insurance in it. Where as opposed to a homeless person where else? Well, there are different departments or uh, policies that allow people living with another family or... Well, then that would not count as homeless. Okay. Living in a garage is not homeless. Yeah, like really homeless. Yeah, like if you looked up homeless, 
what that says. Now here's the other challenge. Where are you going to build the treatment center? I don't know. I don't know. Can I say something? Yeah, sure. So, first of all, folks, uh, you know, you can throw out numbers like there's $13 million, or when we sit, we calculate what it costs for a person to be homeless. So, whether it's $65,000, $85,000, whatever. Um, so, think about where that, how they're calculating that number. So, some of it is because police make contact. Well, police have to get paid every day regardless if they make contact. Fire department goes out and they take somebody in. They still get paid every day. The emergency room sees somebody. That's calculated. So all of that money that's spread out over the place, in Lake Elsinore, we estimate we probably have, what, 70 people? That was the point in time. Probably more like twice that. So if we had twice that, we're probably looking at $12 million. I can tell you now, I can calculate what our city spends on cleanup and some other things. It's probably about $200,000 a year. It ain't $12 million. So when they throw out those numbers, it's great you know, th that they're calculating that, but I have to take that money from the emergency room, I gotta take it out of the fire department, I gotta take it out of the police department, I gotta take it everywhere that we're calculating these services. Mm -hmm. So Lake Elsinore is not sitting on $10 million because that's what they estimated that a homeless person is on the street. And some of that cost is the, the, the money that they would earn if they were in a regular job. You're talking so, about the, the homeless person? Yeah. Yes. All right, so are you saying that um, the $136 million, we're going we're gonna to spend that anyway, so why spend it on homeless people? No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Okay. I'm saying you can't find $136 million. Find it. Show me, you sit down today and, and show me where I can take $136 million out of someone's budget right now because they say we have 1,600 homeless in our county. Yeah. Yeah. And not have a police department. Yeah. So that's my point. So those numbers, you know, when you say that, I mean, there, it's just not there. There's not $136 million in this county that you can pile up unless you do a bond measure or something to do this. So it's not like we in government has taken this money and decided we're not going to help the homeless. That's yeah, yeah. Well, I know. But, but I mean, that's, you know, but again, I think some people get the impression. It's just like saying if we put a person in jail, it costs $65,000 to house that person. Well, the reality of that person was, and, and that's probably a true cost, $65,000, $70,000, but if that person was out producing, we would probably have a net income of about, what, $120,000. But the reality is that jail is open regardless. Those guards are still at the jail, so calculate any way you want. Yeah. So that's my point. Okay. So, well, well, Up 
drugs and all the right. other crime and all the other stuff. So yes, they will, there is going to be a savings, especially from the, the group that's assembled here, but it's still not solving a whole problem. So, so then... Well, my, my point, and I, st I began by saying this, it wasn't so much about the numbers, because I don't know the numbers, really. It's about the point, which is, and the, my point is, if you're going to spend $136 million or $36 million or 36000 spend it on something that you can tell does some good. Stop spending it on stuff you can't tell does some good. So you're betting, and I agree with you, by the way, that spending your money on this is going to do some good in a way that you'll be able to tell it did some good. Yes. Okay, well, let's do that with the rest of the money. We're, 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 yeah, I know. I know. Let me, let me say something. We have worked and we have gotten five people off the street this month. So yeah. technically, five people. We should have $400,000 if it's, you know, or whatever the cost, of the, you know. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. So technically, that, yes, that money is is calculated, but that money isn't true savings. So pulling five people off the street isn't going to be. But I, but I think the point is just making sure we're spending it in the right ways. Are we taking the money that we have, the limited resources that we do have, are they being spent in the right in the right and best ways? If you are going to do an improvement on your house, you're going to make sure you get the best bang for your buck. And it's the same concept going back to. Um, emergency rooms and insurance companies, are they spending their money wisely? Why can't we reach out to them and say, you have repeat offenders coming to the emergency room that do cost you money. Why don't you give cities some money to help solve homelessness? Hey, insurance company, you send this guy to treatment five times every time he ends up back on the street because no one helped him after he got out of treatment to get a home. So now he's just sitting on the street again. Why don't you give us some money for homelessness? That's where the whole community has to come together and say, where are we? Where are we? not putting our money in and getting the best return on that investment. Well, see, that kind of thinking and this whole discussion that we're having here, you could say, you could say, why spend money to improve the roads because people are going to drive on them anyway? So why, why spend the money there? That money comes out of thin air somewhere. I mean, that doesn't, that, that money, well, we, we get that money from somewhere. Yeah. They deteriorate. If we don't manage, you know, I think what we're doing really, we're helping homeless who are willing to be helped, and we're yeah. trying desperately to help them. Yeah. You know, we're trying to help them desperately. So the ones that won't be helped, we're just really managing this problem so that it doesn't grow and turn into Anaheim or San Diego. Uh, you, you know, one example, when I worked in San Diego, yeah, I get it. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, or even urgent care. Yeah, so, so I understand your point. I mean, that's the same point that you're trying to make here. And if we could do those kind of things, the, the problem is you've got to have that pot of money somewhere mm -hmm. in order to do that. If, if I could build a facility and a rehab and, and deal with all the people, that would be a great thing. But I can't assemble that kind of money because, again, that money is spread out everywhere. It's spread out police and fire and hospital yeah. and insurance companies and, and on and on and on. So it's not like... Okay. Help me, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask a question about addiction? Since that's that's one thing that we battle with and try to motivate people into rehab or yeah. How, how would you help us help them in rehab? Like, what type of motivators can we use? Well, is there anything that um, if you don't do something? Which isn't you know about you. It's about anybody who doesn't do something. 
then you're just waiting for them, hoping they hit bottom before they do major damage to themselves. Okay, so is there a way for you to? How can we raise that bottom? Right? Yeah, is there? Or make it their problem? Yeah. Okay. Well, Are they breaking the law? Yeah, and that's, that's what I was going to get at, is that would be an avenue if they actually follow through and punish them for the crimes like they used to. I mean, if you got caught, like you say, with, with drugs, you could be sentenced for a long time. Now these guys are getting, um, sadly, the fact that we're going to take them to jail and they'll be out within a couple hours and their life is going to be no different. It'll be the same as yesterday, yeah. Well, to me, the intervention at that point isn't on the addict that you pick up. It's on the people that are deciding not to do something. You know, like, like, yeah, yeah. Well, I understand that. It would be the same thing as if, as a parent, someone legislated to me that no matter what my kids did, I couldn't do anything. Which is also happening, by the way. Right. Allocated. Well, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> well, no, what, what, I, what I was going to say, which I think is related or maybe not, is that, and I think you could pretty much talk to any of the interventionists I know or whatever, because I know a bunch of them, would say that insurance is the biggest enemy of the addict. Insurance is the biggest enemy. Um, and then figure out a way for them to get help without insurance. I mean, but that's, we're always trying to do that. You know, the only way that I have been able to get an addict help without insurance is to talk my treatment center person into doing that. And some of them do, but not compared to the need that's there, you know. Then I then I'll call, you know, the emergency room person up and say, you know, I got somebody come in and in, but they can't pay for anything, so I'm mean, I need to talk you into letting them stay there for free till they go to the hospital. And maybe she would do that, but not every time. You know, she might do that, but that doesn't solve the problem. I don't know. This this discussion is the same discussion that's been going on forever about there's not enough resources to meet the need. And there's not enough resources to meet the need. Um, but I still think 
that uh, we would come up with some resources to meet the need if we stopped using resources for things we don't agree with that resulted in nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Like what? Yeah. 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 Yeah, Salvation Army programs, you really have to want to be there yeah. because those are like six month, year long. I mean, those are whatever. But on my side of doing, doing interventions, you can't do an intervention and send them to Salvation Army. And you can't do an intervention if they have Kaiser Permanente insurance. <laughs> because you know, I do an intervention on her, and she says yes. Now, we all met with her, and everybody's crying, and you finally say, okay, I'll go. Then you've got to call Salvation Army, and they say, hey, do you want to be here? And you go, hell no, they're making me go, and then they don't let you come anyway, so you get one last chance to sabotage it. And with Kaiser Permanente, you have to go see their person next after the intervention, and then they don't get the real story, and then they go, I don't, he doesn't need to go to inpatient. We'll just send him to some in-network outpatient thing. You know, if he fails that a few times, then we'll send him to inpatient. And how can they not see that that spends more money? But evidently, they can't see that. You know, I've had very good success with people in Salvation Army treatment centers, but not from interventions. You know, people who just said, I need to do something. I don't have any money. What do I do? Go there. Okay. But that's the exception. Yeah. I have a question. When you're getting prepared to do an intervention, you've met with the family, you've kind of sort of gotten intel on them, so to speak, correct? Like, do you use some of the information? All right. Let me answer that. Let me tell you about that. Okay. Okay. When I do an intervention, it's a two-day event, and the first day is the most important day. And the first day is the training day, and that's the day that people skip when they try to do it themselves. They just keep doing the second day over and over again, which is the intervention. Okay. And then the addict ends up running the meeting or, or negotiating into some stupid solution. Okay. When you do an intervention, there's one of two obstacles that you have to overcome. One is denial. That's why you read letters, because it's like, it's like an addict's life is like a broken mirror. And there's pieces all over. So what you've been doing is holding up your piece and saying, hey, Ralph, can't you see what's going on? He just sees his eyeball. So you're not wrong. That's his eyeball. And then he goes, you don't know what's going on. And he's not wrong either because you don't know what's going on. You just have your piece. And she's got a piece and like this. And we want to build one great big mirror and hold the whole thing up. Okay? And then they can see it. But in the meantime, you all can see her piece too because you didn't know about that before today. So everybody gets a clear picture of how bad the situation really is. Okay, that, so when we're done with that day, if you watch the show, that doesn't give you a very good indication because that's kind of like we talk a little bit and write letters. When we're done with the first day, we know what we're going to say, what we're not going to say, who's going to say it, what order we're going to say it, and where we're going to sit, how we can get in the same room, who's going to chase her if they run out the door, what are we going to say when we catch them, every single detail. So the only thing that's missing is for them to say yes the next day, and if they do, we're on the way. It's not, 
yeah, you're right. You know, I'll go next Tuesday. No, we're going. You know, there's no negotiating. And um, so we're prepared. And it's very much to me like the hard day to me is the first day. Because I'm doing the training. You know, that's my lots of work day. And actually, it's more, I see it more as an intervention on the system because up until now, it's been okay for the person to be sick there. And now it's not anymore, okay? So we, up until now, everybody's been playing the same song, but they've been playing it in different keys at different times, and the addict's been conducting the music. So now we got all the instruments, we're going to play the same song in the same key, and I'm going to conduct the music tomorrow, and they're going to play the song we wrote yesterday. And anything that comes out of their mouth that isn't yes is no, even if we like it. And anything that comes out of their mouth except yes is noise, so we don't even hear it. Are you going? No. Whatever, you know. And um, denial, that's why we do the letters. That's to overcome that by holding up the picture and uh, or if there isn't any denial let's say we're, we're going to have an intervention on you and you you roll over right away and you go I know <laughs> okay we're not going to keep reading letters trying to convince somebody they have a problem if they already just said they have a problem because all that does is pound them into the ground but that brings us to the second obstacle which is they have a stupid plan <laughs> okay so either they have denial or you're right, I'll do this. I, you're right, I'll stop drinking. Well, that's a stupid plan because it could put you in danger. And plus, it's not a big enough plan because that acts like sobriety solves this and it doesn't. Recovery solves this. Um, or I'll go to 90 meetings in 90 days and see a psychiatrist. No, you're going to Sierra Tucson, you know. And there are times when it looks like I'm negotiating, but I'm not. Okay, so the person says, no, I'm not going. And I go, can I just talk to you alone for a minute? So we go outside, and they say, there's no way I'm going to Sierra Tucson. No way. Well, then what will you do? What do you mean? Well, what will you do? You won't do that. What will you do? Well, I'll go to 90 means in 90 days and see a shrink. So you'll do that. Yeah, okay, let's go tell them. Now, I have already coached them to say no. Okay, so, so Ralph, <laughs> Ralph doesn't like your plan, but he's going to tell you about his plan. Tell him. No. Ralph, they don't like your plan. Come on back outside. Okay, okay I can't go today, but I'll go in three weeks. So you'll go. Yeah. Well, they'll like that. Let's go tell them. I'm not going today, but I'm going in three weeks. Say no. No. Can't go in this week, but I'll go on Monday. Okay. No. Seven times one time. Meth addict, living in his parents' farmhouse, driving their pickup truck two miles away. He says, screw you, and he gets, goes home. I said, I'll go talk to him. I go over there. I say, you know what? They're not going to take no for an answer. What will you do? Well, I can't go today because, you know, it's amazing to me how addicts did not have a life until now. Right. <laughs> now they got job interviews and doctors. Are <laughs> Listen, don't get me wrong. I love addicts. They're my people. I get I love them. Okay. <laughs> what will you do? I'll go in three weeks. Okay, I'll go tell them. Drive halfway back, smoke a cigarette, go back. They said no. Two weeks. Okay. I don't have to go all the way back. I know they're going to say no. I taught them to say no. Seven times. And then the guy went. Because now, it's kind of feeling like it's his idea. It's weird. Men are like this. Women aren't like this. No, it's like I did a thing in Albuquerque last two Saturdays ago, and the guy said, screw it. The guy was richer than God, first of all, so there was no bottom line. You know, and he said, no, I'm not going to get the hell out of my house. And then five days later, he checks into treatment because it took him that long to make it look like it was his idea. <laughs> it's, oh, man. I do love my job, though, but 
back to this issue. There's got to be a way to raise bottom. There's got to be, a, I don't know what that is because I don't live in the same trench that you do, but there's got to be a way. We, we can't just say there's no bottom line for somebody because they're richer than God, and there's no bottom line for somebody because they don't have anything. You know, we got to, there's, we, there's got to be a way to say it's, you can't go in this direction any farther. Um, yeah, yes. Just a real curious question. Do you have an idea of your close rate when you're talking in? How, how often do you get people to flip? At the intervention? Yes. 98%. And that's not me, that's the interventions. You talk to any interventionist, 98%. Now, the 98% is probably 90% and then 8% that guy I just told you about. Who, who you know calls up a week later and you find out they're in treatment. But interventions are very effective, and that's not because of me. It's because if you do it right, they work. You know, and people are more likely to do better after treatment if they got there as a result of an intervention in the first place, because the system has been rearranged around them, so it's harder for them to go back into that system and have it act the way it did before they went. Which I think really is the key, by the way. Isn't true that you can't really intervene if there's no, um, if, if the person has nothing? If you're dealing with stri strictly a homeless person who has, you know, no place to live, no income, no nothing, what do you use for leverage? That's my exact question. The same thing as the guy who's richer than God, though. See, he just says, yeah. "I'm headed to my yacht. Bye." Well, I do too. I, I think that probably if you guys got, we are talking about getting some people off the street this week. Aren't you? You were talking about that you had gotten some people off the street this week? Okay, that wasn't because of that. It was because you had a relationship with them that into, to where they were listening to you now. Yep. Yeah. And we've had, you know, more success with that, with that probably Because I don't know what bottom line you'd have with that person otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's use the 13 million to pay their salary. <laughs> oh man, we're out of time pretty much. I'm not going to start on a new topic here, but I will answer some more questions or something or let let you say your concerns, yeah. Well, I'm a fan of drug court. I think drug court works, and I think drug court works better than not having drug court. So I, I say bring it back or get it going. And, you know, we're buying all this other stuff with pretend money. Let's buy that with pretend money, too. <laughs> I mean, what money does anybody have that's real anyway? I mean, what, how many trillion dollars are we as a country in debt? You know, if I was three, $25 trillion in debt, I couldn't do anything. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I, I would try, but, you know, I don't know. I couldn't get up in the morning. Uh, so a lot of this money is just not real anyway. Right. You know, so heck. Let's spend it. <laughs> I don't know. See, you're now you're now out of you're now out of my area. You know, you get a fa an addict or a family in range of me. I know what to say. This is this political and 
financial, I don't, I don't know what to say about that except for let's just pay for stuff that it helps, you know. All right, go home. All the, cause all, all, those, all those homeless addicts have been robbing stuff for two hours now. <laughs> Thank you.